I think it is so important that we learn about Varroa mites and how they work, what they do, what drives them as a whole, so that we can understand them better as an actual organism, so that we can figure out what we can do to actually help our favorite insect, the honeybee. So today I have a mini lecture coming right at you, all about Varroa mites. Let's go. So first, let's get our cup of coffee or a cup of tea, cheers, and let's get started. So first, what are they? Roa mites are these little parasitic mites that like to live on a bee on the underbelly underneath their plates where they hide and suck out all the nutrients from a bee. They have no eyes and no antenna, so they're not really considered an insect. They're called an arachnoid. Arach I don't think I'm pronouncing that right, but <laughs> they're pretty much this little mite with a uh, crazy monstrous looking mouth that punctures the bee and like I said, sucks out all the nutrients. The reason that they are so detrimental to our honeybees is because when they do this, they are sucking out what is called vitelogenin in a bee. And vitelogenin is pretty much the reason why our bees can actually make it through the winter time. It is this protein that lives in the fat body of the bee. And it's what they use to create brood food, to um, perform an immune defense against different viruses and diseases. They also use it to define the difference between a forager bee and a hive bee or a nurse bee. So it's something that is really important. And as the winter months progress and there's less and less food source in the colony, they rely on that vitelogenin that is in, the bo in their body in order to be able to secrete brood food in the spring when they start rearing brood again. So the fact that the mites feed on this vitelogenin is detrimental to our bees because like I said, it's really important to them and they really need it in order to survive. So how did we even get varroa mites in the first place? So it's kind of a little bit unknown about where exactly they came from. I've read many articles that all say something different of where they originated, but pretty much the general gist of what happened is varroa mites originally lived on Asian honeybees, so Apis serrana. And what ended up happening at some point in our trades with honeybees, trying to breed different bees together, at some point, Varroa mite got transferred over to Apis mellifera, or what we know as the Western honeybee. And when that happened, the Varroa mite was able to mutate and change so that they were able to exploit our Western honeybees. So, and when that happened, it pretty much just became a wildfire that spread across all of Asia, all of Russia, all of Europe. All and then ended up spreading to North America, South America, and spread pretty much almost all over the world. There's still um, some countries that have not had that strain, that subspecies of Varroa mite found yet on their bees. So, yeah. So, one of the key things though is that Apis serrana, the Asian honeybee, they evolved with Varroa mites. So, since they did this, they've already learned their own mechanisms to be able to fight off Varroa. We saw this same thing happen with um, the Africanized bees in Africa and South Africa. They were able to adapt and change so that they could fight off Varroa on their own. But the way that the Asian honeybee does it, I thought this was so interesting when I read this, was first varroa mites in the Asian honeybee for some reason only go towards drone brood. They do not go towards worker brood at all. But then whenever a bee and whenever an Asian honeybee finds that there is varroa mites in that drone brood, they cover that cell with a thick layer of wax. And what that does is it suffocates, it cuts off all of the, the oxygen going to that cell through the, the small wax capping so that not only the larva suffocates, but all of the mites in that cell also suffocate. So it pretty much stops the spread of varroa mites with them. But our Western honeybees have not yet developed any sort of defenses. Um, there has been some recent research in the last five years that we have been developing a kind of bee called a VSH uh, bee, so varroa sensitive hygiene, 
that is able to actually fight off Roa on its own. Um, there's a couple different kinds. There's one that will groom um, all of the bees and be able to pick off Roa from those bees. And then there's another strain of bee of Western honeybee that is able to sniff out the pheromones that are released by the mite in the actual cell and they'll open up the cell and remove them and the larva. Uh, but more on that later. <laughs> so, okay. Let's really dig into this. So why, if a honeybee has a mite on it, you would think, okay, whenever we have something on us, like a, like a tick or a bug or something bites us, we have some sort of feeling where we're just like, oh my God, there's something on us. We've got to get it off. We actually feel it. Well, the honeybees can too, but the reason that they do not recognize that they have a mite on them is because those mites are freaking smart, unfortunately. So they're able to mask the chemical signals that the bees are giving off saying, hey, I have a mite on me. Varroa mites, because they don't have eyes and they don't have antenna, but they have a nose and they have that, that little scary mouth that they have, they actually work off of pheromones just like honeybees do. And because of this, like I said, when they latch onto a bee, they're able to mask any pheromones and chemicals of distress that that honeybee is releasing, trying to tell the other uh, workers in the colony that they have a mite on them so that the other workers, they have no idea what that bee is saying. Pretty crazy stuff that those mites do. And when the mites reproduce, they like to crawl into a open brood cell and they'll hide in the, in the, uh, in the brood food. And the mites themselves have adapted and evolved to be able to breathe in that brood food. They'll release something that looks kind of like a straw and they'll, they'll, it'll be just above the brood food and they'll be able to breathe through that so that whenever a worker bee comes in and inspects the cell, because they do it many times while that cell is open, the worker bee doesn't even know that that mite is there. That is what's crazy. They are so freaking smart and it sucks. <laughs> So since we're on that topic, let's talk about how do the mites even reproduce in the first place? So their reproduction is heavily favored towards mutations. And the reason for this is what happens is when there's a, a, a varroa mite on a nurse bee, that nurse bee then crawls on the comb and goes over an open brood cell and that varroa mite jumps off the bee because remember they're mostly on the underbelly of the bee so they're closest to, to the comb and they jump into that cell and go all the way to the bottom and hide in the brood food. Then once that cell is capped around day eight, day nine, they then go up and they start feeding on the larva in that brood cell. And when they do that, that gives them nutrients to then start um, creating eggs. And the first egg that they usually lay is always a male. So when that male hatches, it then goes up and starts feeding on that larva. But during this process, as both the mother and the male are feeding on the larva, whenever they need to defecate, they go up to the top of the cell and that's where they pretty much start creating a feces pile, which is actually a good thing that they do this. Um, more on that soon. And so this, they continue this process until the male is fully sexually developed and the mother starts laying female eggs. And she can lay, from what I was reading, she can lay up to one egg every single 30 hours. So she can lay up to like seven or nine female eggs in that cell that then develop um, and mate with the male during the course of that cell being covered before the, the brood ends up ha um, coming out as a bee. So when that bee comes out, there can be around nine female fertile mites that come out of that cell. Because as they're in this cell, they're all breeding with that one, their brother, that one male that is in that cell. So because of this, they're inbreeding, but the reason why the way that they reproduce really favors mutations is say that one female mite created some form of mutation when she laid any of those eggs, especially if it's the male. That male then mated with all of those females and now there's nine female mites with this mutation that can then go on to the next cell and create another nine mites in that cell. So nine times nine, I don't even know why I can't do math right now. That'd be wait what nine times nine so that'd be 
9 times 40, and a 9 times 5 is 45. So, 81, right? I don't even know why I can't do math right now. Oh my gosh, it's been so long since I was in school. But anyways, 9 times 9, whatever that equals, I'll put it up on the screen. That's how many mites can be created in literally, like, two weeks. That's insane. And then they just exponentially reproduce like crazy after that. So, like I said, say that one mite had a mutation, now all of these mites have that mutation. And that is why it is so dangerous if you're creating a resistance to treatments in our mites. But again, more on that in a minute. So, how do the bees how do the mites even overtake the bees to begin with? So, I'm going to put up a chart. Hopefully Mel is okay with this, but I got this from his book it's called ots queen rearing a, Survi a survival guide for beekeepers world worldwide and um it is a absolutely great book but this chart in here really shows how quickly varroa mites can grow and exploit a colony and it is truly crazy how they do this so as these mites reproduce exponentially, they keep growing and keep growing and keep growing. And as there's more brood, there's more cells for them to hop in and reproduce as the colony gets bigger. Well, then around mid-July, when the colony starts to decrease their numbers in the colony as they start preparing for winter and as the, the summer flow starts to come to an end, that is when the mites have pretty much gained their footing in that colony and they explode and they go up crazy high. But the problem is, is like I said, the bee population is going down. So when this happens, there becomes more mites per bee. So instead of only like a third of the bees having mites, now half of the bees have mites and then two thirds of the bees have mites and then all of the bees have mites. And by the time that happens, all of those bees are severely weakened weakened, and the colony pretty much collapse, collapses in the fall. So as the mites are doing this, they are draining the bees of any nutrients and any strength that they have. Because remember, like I said, they feed on vitelligenin, which is something that is incredibly important for bees, especially for winter bees. And also as they do this, they transmit viruses. They transmit around like nine viruses. I'll put all the different viruses up here on the screen just to show you how many that there, that there are that they transmit. But this can be devastating to a colony and that colony eventually collapses. So can the bees overcome viruses? Yes, they actually can, but they have to be strong. They have to have enough nutrients in their body to be able to fight it off. And something that's really cool about them is the way they do it is they fight off viruses with that vitelligenin that I keep talking about. They use what is called the immune priming system to pretty much ingest micro particles of this virus. And they use vitelligenin to then excrete it into their brood or move it into their brood food and excrete it to the brood so that any... Um, so that any new larva is given a very small dose of that virus, kind of like in a form of a vaccine, so that they can then form a defense to that virus. So it's pretty cool that they do that. But the problem is, if the bee is not strong enough and they don't have enough vitelligenin and they don't have enough nutrients in their body, they're not really going to be able to do this because they're going to be severely, severely weakened. So it's kind of like a balance of the of the two between the viruses and the mites that you really need to have your mite numbers down in order to be able to fight off those viruses. Otherwise, the bees aren't going to be strong enough to do it. So it's cool that the bees do that. They're pretty smart and yeah. I will put up a video of something I saw this summer um, quite a few times actually, but have you ever gone into a colony and saw that one of your brood cells is open and it looks like the bees have chewed off its head? This is what, um, what a lot of research is showing is that usually th this brood is infected with deformed wing virus and the reason that the head is chewed down is because the worker bees, the nurse bees, they're chewing down this brood so that they can take in viral particles from that brood so that they can then start this immune system priming that they then use to help build immunity in the brood. 
So if you ever see this, don't be alarmed. It's actually a really good thing that they're doing this. It means they're trying to form some form of immunity to that virus. But since we're on the topic of the immune system, there is also one really cool thing that is that lives within a colony and that is the microflora of that colony which is pretty much like the microbiome of that colony kind of like what we have with our gut microbiome and what it is is it's responsible for the immune system and functioning of that colony and it's how they fight off viruses and diseases and different sicknesses that the bees can possibly get but the problem is when you treat with organic acids Organic acids and um, essential oils actually completely sterilize the colony of their entire microbiome. It kills off all of the beneficial fungi and all the beneficial bacteria that they use to fight off viruses. Kind of like when we take an antibiotic and it does the same thing to us. Now, they're able to build it back, but it takes a while. So think of this. You have a colony that has a high mite load and a high viral, viral load. Now you treat them. You don't want to treat with a chemical treatment because of the problem with building resistance that we are seeing with chemicals, uh, chemical treatments right now. But then your other option is just an organic treatment. But if you use an organic treatment, it completely sterilizes the colony. So now they don't have anything to fight off the viruses. So now they really succumb to the viruses and the mite load that was present in that colony and they end up collapsing. So both options kind of not really a, a win situation. It's like a lose-lose situation. So I'm going to get a lot of hate for this, but personally, I truly believe that we need to find another way to be able to combat Varroa in our colonies if we want to see success of our honeybees. Now, something I forgot to mention is how I just said chemical treatments have been shown to build a resistance in our honeybees, and that's because of those mutations I was talking about. So when you treat a colony with a chemical treatment, it doesn't kill off all of the mites in that colony. So any mites that are left behind, they were strong enough to survive through that chemical treatment. So that means those mites are now present in that colony and able to reproduce. And every single one of those mites has the ability to fight, to make it through chemical treatment. So then when they make babies, those ones can make it through chemical treatments. And before you know it, you have an entire colony full of Varroa that has no reaction to chemical treatments and are just like, heh. Haha, ha, joke's on you, you're not killing me. So, like I said, chemical treatments is not really our best bet just because of how quickly they're building resistance, but also organic acids, not really our best bet either because we're sterilizing our colonies and now they don't have any sort of immune system defense against outside pathogens coming into the colony. So, and because of this, this is why it is so important that we start breeding honeybees that have a resistance to varroa mites and the issue that we're seeing is when we continue to treat our honeybees we're kind of propping up actually we are propping up genetics of honeybees that rely completely on being treated in order to survive varroa and um one of the more recent things is that we're seeing some of our colonies are finding varroa resistant traits we'll see it in when we look at our brood pattern i noticed that this year that i have saskatraz bees and they do have some varroa resistance they always had super low levels of varroa which is absolutely great but one of the things that i noticed throughout the year is that they never had that perfect brood pattern that used to be really sought after that beekeepers would look at the brood pattern and if it wasn't completely filled out and perfect they would think there was something wrong with the queen and they would replace her but really this is the bees cleaning out cells that had varroa in them because they can smell the varroa in that cell um oh and i forgot one other thing too i'm sorry i'm jumping around all, like everywhere i tried to plan this video out video out like by points but i don't know you know how conversation goes i'm just kind of like spilling all this info that i've been learning at you guys but okay so remember how I mentioned when the bees are reproducing and they feed on the larva and they go up to that feces pile at the top of the cell. They go up to this designated area and that is where they defecate. This is a good thing. 
because when they do that, the bees can smell this feces pile right underneath the capping because they do it at the top of the cell. Now, hopefully the mites don't at some point mutate and start defecating in other places of the cell. This is possible. This could potentially happen. But right now, as far as we know, they're still defecating at the top of the cell, which, like I said, this makes it so the bees can smell it and they'll open up that cell because they'll know that something's wrong. So yeah, that's a really good thing. But okay, so as I was saying, why is it important to breed mite resistant bees? So right now we primarily have the Korean and Japanese subspecies of mites. There are so many different species of mites. I will put up a chart that I found in an article that I was reading that shows all the different species and it shows which types of honeybees have these mites. Now, we only have a small fraction of the varroa mites that are even uh, like here in this, here on this planet. And what researchers have been seeing is that there are varroa mites of other subspecies that have been trying to hop onto Apis mellifera, our Western honeybees, but they haven't had much success yet, which is good, but we don't know how long that's going to last. At some point, we could have another subspecies of mites form a mutation and end up exploiting our honeybees even more. So because of this, personally, my opinion, I know I'll get hate for this. It is absolutely crucial that we breed bees that are mite resistant and show these traits. Because that being said, will we ever get rid of Varroa? I hate to say it, but no, we won't. The key is that we're trying to restore the equilibrium between the host and the parasite, the bee and the varroa mite, so that the bees have the upper hand and that they are winning. But right now, the scale is really tipping towards varroa. And like I keep saying, again, I'm gonna get hate for this, but if we keep treating our bees as heavily as we do and propping up bad genetics, that scale is going to tip more and more towards Varroa until Varroa literally takes over our colonies and honeybees don't really have a fighting chance, especially as they become more and more resistant to the treatments that we're using. So I know this is kind of like a heavy video. Um, varroa mites is kind of like a touchy subject with a lot of people. Like I said, there's a lot of different, differing, um, opinions on varroa mites and how to treat, how to get rid of them. But like I said, I'm just here to share all the information that I'm reading. Um, I will post all these articles in the description that I'm reading as well for you guys to read and learn with me. But I'm just sharing the information that I'm learning so that we can all use our head and think, okay, how can we help honeybees fight off Varroa themselves? Because the more you know, the more things you can figure out and you know, it always helps to know more. Now, something that I have been looking into that I am seriously thinking about utilizing this year is using a brood break in July. So let's go back to that chart by Mel that um, I had showed. Again, go check out his book. Um, I have never met the guy. I'm honestly just saying this because his book is that good. So seriously, like go check it out. There is so much good information in it that you could definitely benefit from. But okay, so let's go back to this chart. And if you look at it, you'll see that when the varroa mites really start taking hold, that is in July. So the key for this is that when those varroa mites are wanting to start when the varroa mite levels are starting to rise that is when a brood break would be absolutely like the best thing that happened to your bees so this year i'm going to experiment with using a brood break in july they would be completely broodless for around 35 days or so and at that point any of the varroa mites in that colony will pretty much explode and just self-destruct and your mite levels will plummet. So that is the way I'm thinking of attacking Varroa mites this year as I am going to be trying to go completely treatment free. Now I know brood breaks are a form of treatment but also my idea with this is is remember how bees are naturally in the wild. So they naturally want to swarm mainly because they need to spread, up, spread and pass on their genetics but when they do this the, the old queen usually goes with them and they leave a new virgin queen behind. And when they do this, 
they have that brood break and that broodless period and that automatically cuts down the mite levels but with the way that we are beekeeping today we're always trying to make sure our bees do not swarm so I think this is something that's key that's really going to help our bees be able to fight off varroa and keep those levels down naturally without destroying the microbiome of the colony and without building resistance to chemical treatments and whatnot. So yeah. <laughs> Okay, so that was a lot of information, but I hope you were able to find something helpful in this video to help you in your research about bees and varroa mites. But this year is going to be a really big year. I am so excited. Um, spoiler, I have teamed up with a local queen breeder in my area that has really been doing some really cool things. He not only has been breeding bees that require absolutely no treatments as he's never treated his bees once, but also he's been performing frugality tests. So the genetic of bee that he has found is able to find bees or is able to find honey in very scarce regions and is able to get through the winter in very little with very little food stores which is something that i think is absolutely key in order to overwinter successfully but also remember what i said about the telogenin guys and nutrients and whatnot now my thinking is that when you when you breed a bee that has vsh traits with a bee like his with that has been through all of these frugality tests that don't need that much food they're able to stay strong with little nutrients so that means when they also have a lot of nutrients that hopefully they're going to be able to be stronger to fight off varroa and be able to fight off any viruses and diseases so yeah, I don't know. This is my thinking. We're going to see. It's going to be an interesting year, but I have a website that I am currently building right now. Um, I've been pouring a lot of work and energy into it. It's really been helping me get through the last couple months. If you saw one of my last videos, um, because I'm really loving it. It is oddly kind of fun, but I'm going to put up a link for you guys to go sign up to receive an email if you would like to hear about these bees when they become available. I'm going to be teaming up with um, a bee store on the east side of Michigan that will be selling my nukes this year and also my queens, but I'm also going to have queens available from these genetics that I'm talking about sometime this year. So if you don't want to miss out because there's going to be a limited availability, make sure you go type in your email and sign up so that you're notified as soon as they're available. So yeah <laughs> anyways i hope you guys are keeping warm and you're enjoying your bee winter and i hope you guys had a great holidays and i will see you guys in the next one oh and i realized i didn't even tell you guys the website oh my goodness okay <laughs> so you can go to beefitbeekeeping.com and that is where you'll find it or beefitbees um and yeah i'll see you guys soon